Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 11th Sunday after Pentecost worship service. It's nice to see each and every one of you, visitors and longtime members alike. Uh, we're glad each and every one of you are here, whether it's here in person or watching us live or watching us later this week. We all find a way to connect, and that's a, a great thing. We just take a couple minutes to look at some of our mission and ministry opportunities and announcements that are coming up this week. There are some things going on. Um, we've got some meetings coming up, so if you are part of one of those meetings or one of those committees, uh, take a look at your meeting date and note when and where you're supposed to be meeting. I know, I think our ad council is this Wednesday, so that's probably the end of this. Oh, did we already have it? No, it's this Wednesday, coming up. Um, we have our barbecue today. Anybody wanna say anything more about that versus me? I know the men's group are per having a great barbecue lunch. I see the barbecue going, I see corn getting chucked, so lots of uh, good food I know will be happening. So, for those conservatives, like my wife's father, I know you're not supposed to wear a hat in church. But this is the United Methodist men's hat, so I wanted to <laughs> let everybody know where the men are here, they're cooking for us. There's Hawaiian burgers, there's vegetarian burgers, there's chicken sandwiches, so lots of things, and bread with corn. So <laughs> stick around and enjoy yourself after the service. What else have we got going on? Anything, Dennis? Uh, youth group uh, is starting today from 5.30 to 7. Uh, Cheryl is our youth director, so anything else, Cheryl, to add to that? Okay, so um, meeting here? Mm -hmm. All right, so hopefully we've got some youth that will get um, our year off to a good start. A new Bible study, Tony, I'll let you talk a little bit about that, is getting ready to start in November. September. September. What's the sound of that? What's that? I mean, Sunday school coming in. You be there and be square. <laughs> yeah. September the 4th, I know it's Labor Day weekend, but we're going to start because the Bible, the book starts that day. And so I don't want anybody to get behind, but if you can't, Order it, let me know. I'll be outside there in the barbecue taking a sign up for a great new Sunday school class. It's all biblically based, promoted by the Methodists. Thank you. And it's drop in. If you, you yes. Know, you can come and go. You don't have Anytime. to do it. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, this next two months, are while well, Pastor Sung is on our sabbatical, we've been very blessed to have Reverend Mary Ellen with us, so she's going to be with us uh, two more weeks, and then we'll have um, two different pastors, um, so we just keep them in our prayers as they come in and bless us with their, their messages. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? All right. Let us be in an attitude of worship.
Thank you, that was beautiful. I invite you to stand and join with me in our call to worship. Assemble before God, our rock and refuge. Come together to listen for the voice of our Creator. The Word of God shakes the foundation of earth. We expect to be changed by God's message to us. God rescues us from cruelty and injustice. In steadfast love, God delivers us from our enemies. We remember the rich heritage we have received. We give thanks for God's grace and mercy. This is God's holy day, a time to lay aside narrow interests. How will we honor God in word and deed? We will delight in the word and works of our God. We will join together in praise and good works. Our opening hymn is Gather Us In. It is in, if you're using the hymnal, it is in the Faith We Sing, number 2236. today. You having a fun summer? Or are you back to school already? Did you go? You Oh, when did you go back to school? Oh, already. Wow, your summer ended early then. Well, 
my, I have a question for you, and I think it's a question that not only the children need to think about, but I think as adults, we all need to think about it too, as people who are Christians. How do people know that you're a Christian? How do you think people can tell if you didn't say you were a Christian and, and told them about where you go to church? What are some of the ways they might know you're a Christian? Uh, you pray to God. You pray, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Well, I thought of some, but I wanted to hear from you first. So maybe I, should I just give you a couple of my ideas? I had to think about it myself when I asked the question. One is that you are kind kind to one another. You can do that at school, right? You can do that when you see people on the street or in the stores. You can be kind wherever you are. And that's a good way to let people know you're Christians. What about helping others? Anybody here help anybody this last week? What did you do to help someone? Oh, you helped him by building with him, right. Okay, is that your brother? Oh, okay. Was he a good help? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you have to think about it, huh? Because it's your big brother. Well, let's see. What are some of the other ways? What about forgiving others? That's a hard one sometimes, isn't it? And sometimes forgiving others means you have to keep praying to God about it for a long, long, long time. Right, everybody? Yeah, sometimes it doesn't make it all better right away, but people will know we are Christians, as the song says. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. So, when you go out from here, when you go out from church, you don't always have to tell people you're a Christian, but the promise is that people will know you're a Christian by your love and by how you treat others. And that's something the adults know too, and that's why everybody shows up at church week after week, because we all need help, and we get help from being with one another. So let's see, I think now we say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's all fold our hands and bow our heads and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Someone here to go to Sunday school? Okay, there you go. Okay, thanks for helping today. Have fun in Sunday school.
Can we give them a hand? I see Joy. <laughs> Joe thinking, we got a clap. <laughs> We are now at the time of our service that we have an opportunity to give back through our tithes and our offerings. Um, just remember that during, as we've come back from COVID, we no longer pass our offering plate. So if you have missed an opportunity to, to make a donation today, the plate will be on the altar after church and there's another one at the back of, of the church. Um, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Gracious God, whose giving knows no ending, we know how to say thank you when we receive. Right now, we say thank you as we give. In our giving, hear our heartfelt gratitude for all that you are and all that we have. Bless these gifts for your mission in the world, and bless the other gifts we also have to bring to your mission, opening our eyes to you, to how we are, you are calling us to participate. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stand. at what makes us a church family is that we are always ready and willing to share in the joys that each of us have and the concerns that each of us have so that we know the we are not in this together but we not in this alone but we are in this together so I will ask um, you if there are any joys and concerns and we'll start Dennis if you have anybody there <laughs> Nope, okay, so um, in our congregation, do we have any joys and concerns we'd like to share? Katie. I'm going to ask you all to please pray for our dear, dear friend, uh, Beverly Tucker. Mm -hmm. She is in Kaiser right now. Okay. Um, okay. Their, son, their son and daughter came this weekend. Their son is coming from Oregon today. And Diana is in Alabama helping their granddaughter, or her daughter, Samantha, their granddaughter. And I talked to Martin last night, and she perked up a little yesterday. So please, please pray for, Di for Beverly at this time, and for Martin and their family. Thank you. Uh, we have some up in the choir here. <coughs> Tony and Cheryl and Larry. Uh, my granddaughter, Emma, uh, fell after she got out of the shower yesterday and uh, hit the uh, metal track on the shower floor and split open her lip and lost a tooth and, and um, one, the front tooth is twisted in her mouth. So um, she's actually doing pretty well, but her mom is kind of <laughs> devastated. And uh, they'll have to go to the dentist and see uh, what they can do to, um, to make sure that the teeth below aren't damaged and to see if they can straighten up that one that's in the front. So just prayers that she uh, gets the care she needs for the best. She's almost three. Yeah. 
Um, it's just, I wanted to say it's a joy to have youth groups start up, but I did see in this the times are not quite correct. Oh, okay. So it's 5.30 to 7. See you tonight. Uh, we had a lovely picnic in our uh, garden last night, and uh, thanks to the hard work of Cece especially, even my grandson Dylan uh, helped dig some holes uh, to get it started. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, uh, take, take a look. It's looking wonderful. Thank you. Well, I think it's a joy to see Hugh and Angela back there. So I, th I think Hugh was going to speak, but... I'm happy to see you. <laughs> uh, the prayer warriors in this church are praying for my daughter-in-law, Renee Hawkins, a uh, breast cancer survivor, but she has brain tumors, and they're progressively getting worse, and she's at the decision-making where she either continues to fight it and, and deal with all of that pain or just, you know, make the decision uh, so I, I ask for prayers for her and Chris and the rest of the family Joe? we've had two uh, joyful uh, family events recently last weekend Joy and I were up in the Mendocino area for a celebration of life for a, a family member a cousin that was held outdoors in a uh, beautiful redwood, um, and it was a very meaningful and, and beautiful time together with family. And while we were up there, Joy and I just took a couple extra days. We rode on the skunk train, and we went through the charming town of Mendocino and, and hiked by the ocean, so that was quite delightful. And then yesterday, we were down in Los Altos Hills for our annual family reunion which was, again, wonderful. Just a lot of visiting, good food, swimming, singing. Um, and what I noticed is that the older generation that was always there at these family reunions, little by little, is no longer there. And we are now the older generation. <laughs> and it's a little mysterious how that happened. But, <laughs> but we en enjoy watching the little kids running around. And, and it's a lot to be grateful for our family. I am sure it was a wonderful time. Any others? I have a joy. My grandson that lives in Spain, he's 19, he's been visiting for 10 days, and we've had a fabulous, fabulous family time, small family, so getting everyone together has been a really wonderful week. Thank you. Okay. Mary Ellen will lead us in a prayer. Oh, do we have another? Sorry. Oh. Uh, this is a hopeful joy. I had uh, hip replacement That's surgery right. four weeks ago. All right. Good to see you here and moving. Let's continue in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, creator of us, creator of all that is, of all the universes, we thank you as we gather to worship you together on this day. We come here with our hearts filled with so many things, but always we want to stop and give thanks for this community of faith, the community that hears us, comforts us, and listens to us. We're very grateful. We thank you for all of our needs being met, and we come to you asking you for whatever it is we need in our lives. As we gather together, you have heard so many of our prayers, prayers of concern, prayers of hope, prayers for a time of decision-making, joys and remembrances, we bring you all of these things, and we also bring you all the prayers that are rumbling around inside of us now. Some of these cannot even be put into words, but they are our longings, our hopes, and our dreams. We trust that they come from you, and we offer them to you, O oh God. 
Help us to be aware to see the places you are moving in our lives. As we gather, we remember not only those who are with us today, but those who cannot be here today, those we are missing. And we also open our hearts and our prayers to the people in the places who live around this church. Some people are longing for a community, a safe place to go to be themselves. Help their hearts be opened, help our hearts to also be opened, that they will come to this place to worship you along with us. As we pray, we pray also for the heart of our nation on this day. We pray that the divisions among us be healed, that we begin to see that we are one people under God. And as we pray, we pray for people all over the world, people whose needs are not being met. We think of the refugees the world over who are leaving their homes because of war, because of famine. Be with each one of them. Help them to find comfort. Help them to find food and a safe place to lay their heads. And so, O oh God, we bring you all of these prayers and all of those even that are unspoken. And we offer them to you in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have the time of the passing of the peace. A peace of Christ be with you. Is there a way to do this during we're just COVID? Gonna, we're just gonna follow along. Here. Oh, okay. So peace be with you. you. Peace be with you. You. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, uh, from the letter of, to the Ephesians. And it may be short, but it is very good. <laughs> very good, very powerful. Find it. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is the word of God for all God's people. Oop, is this on? Yes. Is, I am on? Okay. How to live in complicated times. And because I titled the sermon on how to sermon, I started to think about the very first self-help book I ever read. I'm going to name it. I think probably someone here has also read the book. I think I would have borrowed that book from the Center Street Library in Milwaukee. And I guess I thought I needed help, even at that time in my life. I was about junior high age. I was naturally shy, and of course, I would have been comparing myself to everybody else, in particular those who seemed to be more outgoing. The very first self-help book was How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> you remember that book? Yes. Carnegie's book is one of the best-selling books of all time. And I looked it up on Amazon. You can buy one for $10.79 on sale. I wonder what the original cost of that book was. It was not the first self-help book. In the late 19th and early 20th century, several self-help books in the English language had great success. Samuel Smiles. Self-help book, that's a good name for someone who's talking about self-help. That was a collection of inspirational stories about hard-working people. And in the same year as, it was published in the same year as Darwin's Origin of the Species, and 
The self-help book, interestingly enough, was the only book that didn't outsell the Bible in that year. Now, there was a self-help book of a sorts as early as 2800 BC, a letter of advice from father to son advocating moral behavior and self-control. But anyway, I want to go back just for a moment to Carnegie's first self-help book, and I think probably some of us still practice some of the things that we learned from him. Some of the lessons are pretty simple. Appeal to the other person's interests. Remember the names of people when you're introduced to them. A person's name is their most important possession. I admit, as an introvert, that's often a difficult thing for me, and I really have to make an effort. And here's one. Approach people with a positive demeanor. Smile and be happy. I have a friend named Joanne who is a master at this. She walks up to everybody with a smile and says, Hello, I'm Joanne. What's your name? I'm sure if you went to the library today, you could also find the book, not just on Amazon. Now, I think it's fair to say that St. Paul did not read Carnegie's book. But, and it's interesting that this passage of scripture from Ephesians was, uh, is sort of a self-help passage, and that's very rare in the scriptures. We have to go back to the scriptures many times in our lives, and often when we return to something we thought we understood in a certain way, we find we understand it in a different way, because the scripture doesn't give us much advice that says, do this, do these things. Now, scholars in later years no longer think that St. Paul actually wrote this letter, although it has been attributed to him. They think it might have been written by a later of Paul's disciples. But since the early Christian communities were suffering at the hands of the Roman authorities, the community uh, followers of Jesus who were teaching such things as this were considered a threat to the Roman state. And even so, the community of early Christians, if unseen, or hopefully to be unseen by the authorities, was growing. And as we read verses after having been so often translated and retranslated and retranslated, we can still look to these passages as offering advice practical advice. It's always useful to remember that the first Christians were Jews, and St. Paul, who was also a Jew, wrote many of his teachings to the Jews as a Jew himself, but then he had to expand his teaching to some people who had no moral education at all. The Gentiles, people who were being attracted to the early Christian community, they will know we are Christians by our love. Probably they were attracted by that love. So much of what St. Paul writes is an apology of the faith. But here and there in his writings are nuggets of practical wisdom. Now here's the one for today. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Sound advice for those of us who must live our lives in relationship to other human beings. Now, <laughs> many of us have spent years in therapy trying to get to that point. I know I have. Getting rid of the bitterness and anger. I grew up in a family that didn't know how to do that very well, and they were my role models. So I still struggle with it today, to offer forgiveness, to not only say I'm forgiving, but to live in a forgiving way. We know that in the past two and a half years, therapists have been even more in demand and often online. And I expect it's because people have got, had to live together in close quarters. 
We need simple instructions sometimes, don't we? We just need someone to tell us how to get to the life we want to live. Simple, but not easy. Gwendolyn Brooks, who is one of the most highly regarded, widely read poets of the 20th century, who was distinguished by receiving a Pulitzer Prize in 1950 for her poem, Annie Allen, wrote in another poem, In Montgomery. She's an African-American writer. And blackness stretched forth the right rough hand to the whites and cherished it to the clearing. The blackness forgave what it would not forget and marched on remarkable feet. The words of Brooks and other social commentators remind us that our forgiveness is not only an individual manner. We learn how to forgive, hopefully, in Christian community. And being part of a community is a good place to learn how to forgive. Because when we're in community, we bump up against each other's rougher sides. So it is in the larger community that we take what we have learned and practiced here in church. So how do we go forth stretching forth our hands to one another, stretch forth the rough hand to the whites? A simple way to do this is to memorize a piece of scripture and take it with you from week to week and month to month you can sit down and read the whole Bible, and I think some of us will have done that at some point in our lives. But to take one scripture to heart, be kind to one another, forgiving, something simple like that, and use that as a sort of mantra as we go about our week and our days and in our relationships with those we are close to and those we encounter. That's how we will learn to live as Christians, by our love. I don't know if any of you have read the book by Joyce Rupp. She's a Roman Catholic sister. And her, she's written quite a few books. And she's well known not only as a lecturer, lecture, uh, lecture, but also as a workshop and retreat leader. Her latest book is called Boundless Compassion. And it is a sort of self-help book. And I read it with that intention. Rupp uses scripture and the stories of ordinary people as well as cultural examples to offer specific practices to develop the compassion that we need and want, not only in our personal lives, but as we deal with the world and with one another. She offers simple ways to practice compassion throughout the book. I've, I've used, I used a journal to write as I read the book because of her practical applications. It's interesting to me that, that Rupp begins the book with a whole section on self-compassion. That seems to be one of the things we need more than anything else. She remind, as, at her workshop, she gives every person who attends a workshop a little plastic bag with four seeds. And she says that if you practice the things that she teaches, if you go through all the exercises and practice and practice it in your ordinary life, these seeds will begin to grow. And the seeds are for non-judgment, non-violence, forgiveness, and mindfulness. The more the seeds are nurtured, the greater the harvest one will see. And Rupp reminds us that as human beings, we are born with the potential for compassion, something we don't always think about or focus about. Just like the flower that's within that little seed, the flower of compassion, she asserts, lives within us. So St. Paul said it another way, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, and even do it 
towards yourself. Many years ago, I took a class, and I took it for a very specific reason. It was called Aikido, a spiritual practice. The reason was, having come out of seminary, I had read lots of theological books, and I'd studied the scripture and continued to study the scripture, but I was too used to doing things in my head and trying to figure out everything in my head. I needed something that would help me embody compassion and love, the gifts of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I needed something that would take me out of my head and into my heart and my whole being. So I took that class to broaden my faith. And I have to say, it was a lot easier to watch the class being done by other people than it was to do myself. We started every class with something that the teacher, her name was Wendy Palmer, called basic practice. We did this in a group. It was really just kind of a warm up. And um, we used an Aikido studio, so there were mirrors on that side and on that side. So as you moved, you could see yourself in the mirror, but you could also see everyone else. I remember it took several classes for me before something clicked. I couldn't seem to get it. I would look at the teacher, and I would see her kind of flowing effortlessly, and I felt like I was all stilted inside. She looked so good. My mind started to go crazy. Doesn't she look good? How does she do that? I can never do that. That guy over there, he's real graceful. She's doing it right. What about me? And then I often thought this, I think you can relate. What does the teacher think about how I'm doing? She wasn't looking at me at all. She seemed to be focused inside. One day as we practiced, something shifted inside of me. And I really don't know why. I expect it's just simply because I was doing the outer movements in a flash of a moment, it was as if my attention dropped away from all those judgmental thoughts, mostly judgmental of myself, that were going on in my mind. It was as if my attention dropped into my whole being, exactly why I'd wanted to take the class. I began to experience the movement. It was quite amazing to me. I wish I could just go back to the moment when that happened again. I became aware of the four, just those few moments of the me that lived inside of all those judgments and thinking and comparisons. I was in my body. I felt like a five-year-old girl at that moment. I felt free free to totally be who I was in the moment. It was at that moment that I realized that the class did have practical applications for my faith. Our faith does not require that we hold firmly to a set of right beliefs or perfect understanding, thank God. For one thing, none of us is capable of perfect understanding. If we demand perfection of ourselves, which I was doing, then I demanded perfection of others. Instead, when I began to see my faith as a practice, something I could keep living into, not just for the time I was reading the books or studying the scripture, but something I could live into with my whole self. As St. Paul said, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Simple words, but not easy. Oscar Wilde said something funny about this. Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. <laughs> I think we're often better at that kind of forgiveness, actually. In my mind, the greatest model of forgiveness in our time was Nelson Mandela. He'd been imprisoned in his home country in South Africa for 27 years. He had been tortured as a prisoner. 
When he was finally released from prison in 1990, Mandela did not call out to his people for revenge, but he called for forgiveness for reconciliation for the people of his beloved country, South Africa. Many of his own people felt betrayed by Mandela. Be betrayed because, like him, they had known the terrors of apartheid. But it is true that we still remember Nelson Mandela as the man who came out and called for forgiveness forgiveness, reconciliation among the people. It is possible that we find it so difficult to forgive others because we are human beings. We notice we don't forgive ourselves. We notice we don't forgive others. And we always long to be something more. How often are we able to say, I did the best I could with what I had at the time? Sounds so simple, but it's a tall order. I want to close with a quote from John Lewis, the former congressman from Georgia. He says this, you have to be taught the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. In the religious sense, you can say that in the bosom of every human being, there is a spark of the divine. So you don't have the right as a human being to abuse that spark of the divine in one another, in another human being. Or as St. Paul said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn, In the Midst of New Dimensions. Again, it is in our faith we sing hymnal, if you're using it.
God's mission field with, true, well, the, with the true gospel of Christ Jesus. May we walk with the spirit and go beyond individual righteousness. May God grow, with, uh, grow us with fruit of the spirit that we may bring communal righteousness to our world. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always and everywhere. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.